announcements. I know that our church, we uh, got a lot of stuff going on, so appreciate everyone bearing with us uh, today. You know, this morning, uh, we're going to continue our series on the parables, and we've been doing that for the last couple months, and really trying to figure out how Jesus used the parable to explain some very complex things in very simple terms. So today, we're going to continue in that today. But uh, happy Labor Day tomorrow. I don't know about you, I'm really excited. It's been uh, really good. Uh, Gabby went back to school, and uh, we're really excited about that. We love the little twerk, but uh, it's great that she went back to school. But uh, tomorrow we're going to get a little day off uh, as well. So I don't think this thing is working. Is it on? All right, there we go. Happy Labor Day. And then uh, I just want to share some good news. I just got back from Asia, and uh, Liam and I were part of the church there. Dad Natalie as well. You see Billy went there and for the 25th anniversary. I got a bunch of guys and gals last year who came and talked about the building that they uh, set up. And uh, this is the inaugural service that they had uh, last week. And the building was able to represent the west side. This is significant in terms of just uh, how God has used the LA church in such a great way. The Vietnam team was sent out here 25 years ago. People like yourself, students, people that moved here, uh, went back. And I appreciate you know people like Dad Doe who missed his graduation just to go back and just to be part of that. And this is a culmination of just their work. And this is just the beginning, the 25th anniversary. Now they have churches all around Vietnam. And this is inconceivable, think about it, uh, about uh, 30 years ago when the country was closed. And yet this is what God has done. And I think we need to really celebrate that as we think about the 30th anniversary, because this came out of LA, amen? Yeah. Pictures there of myself. <laughs> I just figured I had that on. But it's great to be back. I uh, appreciate our singles ministry. Last night we did the open mic. Who won the open mic, by the way? Okay, Joe almost won. Okay, great. Appreciate Steve. Let's continue to pray for Doug Bundy. I got to go with Doug. Doug is waiting for a kidney transplant from UCLA, so he's on call. And uh, a lot of times he can't make it with us. I'm so glad about our our, uh, our ability to do our services live. And uh, so Doug is watching. Hey, Doug, great to see you. And then I, I got to share this. I know we're a little bit short on time. Here. This is Reggie. Speaking of Asia, how this relate? I'll tell you how it relates. This is Reggie. Reggie was a world-class runner himself, right? Came over to the house last week and had some breakfast together. I sat down with Reggie and I said, hey, Reggie, I'll make you some breakfast. He goes, great. You know, he's, he's a single guy, so he's like, awesome. He was so excited. I said, uh, what do you think about some dogs and some eggs? And uh, he paused for like five seconds. I was like, why is he pausing? And then I put it together because he thinks that I'm from Asia, that when I say dogs, I meant dogs. So he looked at me really weird. I figured it out and said, Reggie, I'm talking about dogs. I'm talking about hot dogs. So we set up for some food on, and uh, Reggie is uh, happy as a clam. You know, I want to talk a little about Labor Day today, just kind of in our sermons about labor. Labor is an interesting thing. And uh, I love this thing here. It says that, uh, and, he, and there's a lot of things and stats that we can read into, right? And figure it out. So in 1992, 12 women worked past the, uh, one out of 12 women worked past the age of 65. That number is nearly one in seven. By 2024, they were going to one in five of a 6.3 million workers, according to the Labor uh, Department projection. What does that mean? It means that a lot of women are becoming more involved in the labor force. And amen? That's a good thing. And I think about you know Gabby, whose birthday is today, and just the future that she has, and a lot of progress has been made. Here's the next step. It says nearly half of millennials expect to change jobs every one to three years, okay? And that's kind of true because, uh, you know, in our company, I, I work part-time in a company in uh, LA, and we hired a meat sheet about a year ago, and he quit on us like nine, after nine months. So, I thought about him. He didn't even make it to the one-year mark. Now I got it a meat sheet. I'm calling you out, man. All right, so. Uh, a, uh, a new ministry is called the uh, Screenland Ministry, and I got some really daunting statistics for 
for you. This is according to the Screen Actors Guild. The average member earns fifty-two thousand a year, but the majority take home less than a thousand dollars from acting jobs. So, so sorry, guys. Streamline Ministry. We need to probably support you a little bit financially. But labor is an interesting thing because, especially as we head into the 2020 elections, because that's what we're going to be talking about, is different philosophy in how we do labor. What happened this past week was really interesting to me, was that uh, the Andrew Luck, at the height of his career, uh, 29 years old, he was slated to make, he already made about $100 million. They say that he was projected to make about another $200 million in his career, and yet, all of a sudden, he, he quit in the middle of a game and as he was standing there, people booed him. Poor guy. And as a 29-year-old man, I really respect his decision because he's, he's, he's valuing his life more than the money that he can make, the quality of his life. You know, there's a lot of things going on that we talk about. But yet the Bible is amazingly relevant to what we're talking about today. And yet when we look at God's word in the Bible, he talks about labor as well, but in a different way than we think of today. And it really is something that I think is going to highlight who God is as the boss, as the creator, as our uh, creator, if you will, uh, and as he calls us into his economy also. Okay? So today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16, but I want to set that up for us as we approach that passage in Matthew chapter 19. Okay? Here's the context of it. What, is, what are parables? And I want to look through just as a reminder what are some common aspects of the parables that Jesus told to unlock some of the things that we can use to read these parables. Number one, they introduce, they're usually introduced to a question. Jesus spoke in response to a question, questions like, you know, who is my neighbor? What is the kingdom of God like? That's one of his favorites when you look at the gospel. What is the, king, what is the kingdom of God like? You know, God, Jesus being God, he's trying to figure out words to communicate to us on just what is it like? And he's pulling out words from the air. It is like this. It is like that. The parable often also says, you know, how often shall I forgive my brother? That's another question. The second part of it is that he uses everyday images. That Jesus' parable includes agricultural imagery because a lot of the people at that time were, were farmers. And uh, he appeals to those in a rural setting as well. The urban images such as a judge, a Pharisee, or a tax collector. You know, praying in the temple, earning in, uh, on investments, and a banquet attended by city people. So the Bible is incredibly eclectic and diverse in its audience. They use nameless characters. You know, Jesus used, you know, in order to maximize the broad application of his parables. Jesus left his characters generic and nameless to appeal to a broad sense of his audience. The parable of the rich man is the only one that uses a name, Lazarus. And some academians uh, actually think that it might not be a parable that Jesus was really talking about a real situation. But that's only a few uh, people. But most people think that it is nonetheless a parable as well. You know, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven. He talked a lot about, you know, uh, what is it like to be a citizen of his kingdom? And what are the responsibilities that we have to be in his church? That's what we're going to be talking about today. And we don't think about that, right? The responsibility of his kingdom. Why? Because we think, well, I come to church, I just do my thing, I sing a few songs, I go home, feel good. You know, and that's it, I'll wait for next week. But that is so far from the biblical narrative of what church and the kingdom is like. It's so different. If any of us read the scriptures, even just for a few pages, we'll see the expectation that God does have for us as people uh, that are in his kingdom, both in the present and in future reality. He uses shocking punchlines at the end. Jesus' parables often conclude in a shocking manner. Parables were not stories that merely educate, uh, entertain, or satisfy curiosity. They, they, they demand interpretation and application. Did you know that Jesus asked more questions than he gave answers for? I mean, he asked a ton of questions. It wasn't just like, hey, here it is, you know, take it. He said, what do you think about it? Who do you think 
that uh, people say I am. Well, what about you? What do you say that I am? He calls us to really think about our faith. I think that's one of the most important aspects of our faith is thinking about his words. His listeners uh, and, and uh, alter their course in life, you know, go and do like the Samaritan. The tax collectors went to his house justified rather than the Pharisees. So Jesus used his parables in a very effective way. Today we're going to look at the parables of the workers. But yet this too, you're going to see many elements of what we just talked about in terms of how Jesus used uh, the parables and how it came about. It started in uh, the time of our lesson today is this life in his kingdom. It started in Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus said this. Some of the Pharisees came to him and tested him. says, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. The two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has put together, let no one separate. You know, the Bible teaches us that God originally made this rule, this plan for mankind, that he is the creator. When he created man, male and female, he wanted them to become one. Our society today is so disjointed, is so confused about so many things, and yet Jesus calls them back to the original intent of God's will. And this is a really important aspect of what we're going to be talking about today, that it is God's will. You know, when I was a young minister, I was really eager to prove my point. You know, every time when people sit down with me and I talk, and I'm trying to pull out all these passages and all these scriptures to try to prove my point. What I've learned over the years is, let's just read one or two and let people think about it. And let them wrestle with God's word. That they have to themselves wrestle and see what God is trying to say. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do to these Pharisees. He said, listen, what do you think of what God is? You have the scripture. What do you think of this? Another aspect was that the children were coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, let the children come. These are the kind of hearts that are indicative of the people in his kingdom. And he used them as an object lesson for the kind of hearts that we need to have. Lena and I uh, had uh, Gabby's birthday party yesterday, and I was scared to death. I was jet lagged, but I wasn't even asleep because I was so scared at the prospect of 25 little girls running around in our backyard. I was scared to death. I was wide awake. I wasn't even sleeping yesterday. But the Bible, I looked around, I looked at their, their hearts and their desire to be together and the way they play and their naturalness uh, together. It was really inspiring as well. And then a rich young man came to Jesus and he said, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him the command. But one thing that he lacked was that the very one thing that kept him from the kingdom was his wealth, and he wasn't willing to give it uh, to God. And the Bible says that when a young man heard this, when Jesus challenged him, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, True, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And here is the question that Peter asked that sparks the telling of the parable. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will be there for us? One thing I appreciate about Peter was that he was a little afraid to ask the real question. And as we approach our 30th anniversary, there are some of us who have been, really been here since the beginning. I've given up so much to be here in LA. Some of you guys are new here. You go, oh, this is a church, great, uh, you know. But it came with a lot of sacrifice. People move places. People gave up jobs. People gave up careers to be here in order to build this church for what it is today. And a temptation perhaps for those people is go, hey, I was here since the beginning. And, you know, I appreciate my wife, to be honest. I mean, she, my wife, I definitely marry up. You know, my wife was, uh, she got accepted to the Ivy League school, decided to stay in California, went to UC Berkeley instead, 
when the church got started here, she was the second wave, came back to LA to help run uh, the, the youth ministry. She drove 30, 40 miles a day just to, to be with the kids. And you know, sorry, UCLA, lowered herself. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but there's a move on UC Berkeley to UCLA. I'm just kidding. Chill out. I'm jet lagged. So forgive me. But you know, it, it, it took a lot of sacrifices for a lot of people to really build this ministry to where it is today. And the temptation for us for those people is to remember all those things that they gave up, just like Peter. And they're like, you know what? We've given up everything that we have. And so, as, as in so many scriptures and so many circumstances in the Bible, he didn't really get the answer that he expected. And Jesus said, listen, you're going to receive a hundred times as much. Don't worry about that. But he went on to tell a story about what the nature of the kingdom is like. And what it is like till today. Number one, and what we're going to learn about God in the story is that he is the founder he is the CEO and the king of his kingdom. The rules that we live by, we didn't just get together as a church and go, hey, this would be me. This would be great. Let's form it like this. We didn't do that. We try our very, very best to try to go back to scripture. And what is the mark of a true church? It's not perfection by any stretch of the imagination. It is the willingness and the attitude to look at scripture and go, we're not that. Let's figure out how we can be what God calls us to be. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I think God gives us a lot of latitude on differences of opinion. What songs to sing, where to meet, what to do. And each different culture has this different nuances. And praise be to God that he allows us to do that. But the heart of it, as he says, is what? To be like a little child. To be willing to grow, to be willing to change, and to be willing to accept that God is the founder, the CEO, and the king of our lives. Amen? Amen. So we're going to jump into the parable right now. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, it says, For the king of heaven is like a landowner. He is the CEO, the king, the boss of our church. And he'll always be that if we submit ourselves to him, who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out again, and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. God is a righteous dude. That, that's the word. In Greek, is dikaios, it means righteous. Dude, God is righteous. And what he does to us and what he teaches us is righteous. I always ask people this. I always ask, you know, when I meet people and I go, hey, listen, you know, how, how's your relationship with God? And inevitably, people will say, oh, it's, it's all right. You know, it, it could be better. You know, I, I think I'm okay. I go to church every once in a while. And, you know, I'm okay. I believe in God. And my second, I always follow up, you know, with this. is, well, what do you think about what God thinks of you? See, there's a second part of any relationship. When I was a young married, when people asked me, you know, it's like, hey, how's your marriage? And I would always answer, great. Years gone by, I don't answer that anymore. I said, ask my wife what she thinks. <laughs> right? Because there's two parts to the relationship. And here the Bible teaches us that the owner of the vineyard, the CEO, the king, he says, listen, I am going to hire you and I'm going to pay you what is right. I've determined what is right. I am the landowner here. And if you want to come and work for me, this is what I set out for you. This is really an important part because if we say that we're Christians, and yet we're really not that involved in our relationship with God's word, what does that tell you about our relationship with God? Right? And I really do feel like, you know what Troy said earlier, that religion has gone down? No wonder it's gone down, because it's ineffective. Religion is just a belief without really a faith in it to really go after what God says. Of course people don't find that attractive. Why would we? The Bible actually says that it's a form of godliness, but denying its power. The power comes from really trusting in God's word. 
and trusting that God has a plan. You know, I really think that the most miserable people on the face of the earth are not, they're, they're definitely not people that are non-believers. And for sure, I know that's not people that are really close with God, not perfect, but we wrestle in their relationship with God. I really think that the most miserable people on earth are religious people. They think they have one foot here, they have one foot there. They're kind of, they don't know what to do. You know, they think they, they love the world, but they have to kind of do this. So our hearts are torn when we're like that. Right? It is awesome that God is the king, the CEO, and the creator, because he knows how we need to live our lives. Amen? So let's really trust in that. I want to talk a little bit about covenants, because we don't talk about that in church today. A lot of times we come to church and we want a good church experience. We want the worship experience. We want to feel good about things. And that's good because a lot of Christianity is about emotions and our feelings. Read the book of Psalms and how much feelings and emotions are laid out. But at the same time, it's not just that. And now this is from a, a book that I was reading. It says, the idea of the covenant is fundamental to the Bible story. At its most basic, covenant presents God's desire to enter into a relationship with men and women created in His image. This is reflected in the repeated covenant refrain, I will be your God and you will be my people. Covenant is all about relationship between the Creator and His creation. The idea may seem simple, however, the implications of the covenant and covenant relationship between God and humankind are vast. We are in a covenant relationship with God. It's done. You know, I do want to welcome back a very special couple with us today. And that's uh, Tiara and Jericho. They got married two weeks ago. Let me get them to stand on the right now. All right. They entered into a covenant relationship two weeks ago. And there's a specialness about that. They belong to each other. It's unequivocal. It's not like loosey-goosey. Oh, I'll see you when I want to. I'll, I'll come home when I feel like it. It's not like that. They're trying to figure it out. It's the same way with God. Amen? Point number two. He's always hiring. God is a good boss. He's like always hiring. He's like, he gets up early in the morning, 6 o'clock. You know, just like my company. You know, people quit on me all the time. So I'm always hiring. He's, he's, he's hiring people. You know, it's six, 6 in the morning. That's when the, the day begins. And at 9 o'clock, he goes out. He goes, what are you guys doing? How come you're not working? Come work my vineyard. He went out again about noon. And about 3 in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. About 5 in the afternoon, he went out and he found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I appreciate God. You know, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? When we go out to Home Depot or some places, and people standing in the corner, they are grown men looking for work. And I, when I see that, it's, just, it's heartbreaking. But at the same time, I really feel a sense of admiration as well, that these people were willing to go out and stand out there and wait around for someone just to pick them up and just to work for a few hours, just for a few days perhaps, and just to get enough money to take care of their family. These are the people that no one, in a sense, wants. These are the outcasts of the society, and that's exactly who God is going after. I appreciate that about Christianity. I appreciate that about our God. That no one was willing to hire these people, but God was. And this is a statement to Peter that just because you were at the beginning, which is great, it doesn't mean that you are the end, Peter. And I'm always hiring, I'm always looking for people to be in my kingdom. And so many of us today, as well as we think about it, we were unemployed, right? We were the outcasts as we look at our lives. And we were the people that were picked last in high school for the sports. We were the people that God looked at and says, I want you to be in my vineyard. Amen? Amen. 
When the evening came, here's where the problem begins. The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received the same pay. Let me ask you, what do you think is going to be next? How do you think that they, these guys were fired up, right? I work at five o'clock, I get off at six, and I get a full day's work. I appreciate my daughter. This is such a millennial thing, right? Elizabeth got a job with Dun and Bradstreet. And then I said, when do you start work? Because I noticed that she's been going in like at nine. She started driving at nine. She goes, yeah, dad, my dad, my day starts at 10 a.m. So what kind of job is that? <laughs> 10 a.m. And she gets up at six. And she gets an hour and a half lunch break. What a great job. Right? She's fired up. What do you think about the people that got hired at six in the morning? How do they feel? Well, here's how they feel. Point number three, he's good. So when those who came, who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These were hired last, worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. It is unfair. Don't you think? I mean, come on, God. I mean, it is unfair. <laughs> I mean, this is so un American. <laughs> it is. It's so unfair. And here's the answer that God gave us. But I thought about this a lot. I thought about what. Do you think they would be happy, though, if they didn't know? about the pay that these other people would get? They only had a hard time, why? Because they knew that these people were getting paid the same. If they didn't know that, they would have been just as happy as the day began, as they collect. And that is the point in some ways of our story. We compare ourselves to other people and that's how we get in trouble. And I think that that's why I think a lot of people has such struggles these days in, in this generation because there are more opportunities to compare than ever, all right? With Facebook, with social media, we see different people's lives and we compare ourselves and there's a sadness that descends on our soul thinking that we're missing out on something. And here's the lesson that God wants us to learn as we close on that. And it puts it everything together. But the owner answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Did you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. I must agree with you that it does seem unfair. And in the world's eyes, this is ridiculous, having the same pay for people that were one hour versus the whole day. But that's the nature of our God. We can either look at him and feel angry at him for what he does, or we can look at him and go, what a good God does. You know that word friend? It's a good word. It is not the same word as when Jesus used in John 15. That word of friend is phileos, which means that's where we get the word Philadelphia from. It means a close partnership, friendship with one with, with, with someone. This one, this friend here, is more in terms of just an associate. Just an associate. Which friend do we want to be? Just a casual observer to God or a phileo friend to God who shares in his heart as well. I want to read this and uh, as we close on out. In Philippians chapter 2, let me take my notes out. 
You don't have to turn there, but just listen. Thank you. And Paul talks about what the kingdom of God is like. And he writes to these people in Philippi. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any, com if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceits. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human kind likeness, and being found in his appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now how much more in my absence, to continue to work your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault and a warped and a crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on that day of Christ that I did not run in labor or in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on a sacrifice and service, service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Isn't that amazing? Paul well, started off talking about Jesus. And somewhere along the letter, it became personal. And it was about like him and us together. That's what we must become. Amen? God bless.